Good evening, year six parents and carers. Welcome to our very last session today, which is going to be horrible history. Before I pass you over to Mr. Chowdhury and Mr. McPaul, just to go through some quick housekeeping. Um, right, Mr. Chowdhury and Mr. McPaul, we're all going to do this together. So what I want for you all to do is literally take your phones and get those cameras ready, scan over the QR code. If you're a lot more um, advanced when it comes to the computer and you can literally just go to slido.com and enter hash 304499. Oh, 05 in my case i am not so i'm going to literally scan there we go perfect okay so and the next thing we need to do is you need to make sure you sign in so we're looking for your name so for example mr mac paul mr mac paul in the house we can see mr mac paul is actually in the forum already so make sure you put in your case put your first name and your primary school okay so in in my case i'm going to put my name is shallow what primary school should i be from Mr. Mike Paul Pelham. Are there any anyone here? Is anyone here from Pelham? So, right, for example, Miss Shallow, I'll just put Bexley Heath Academy. Bexley. Perfect. Okay, so I'm actually in the group now, so I'm ready to go as well. Right, so um just any last minute um questions that you might have here will be the four rooms i can see yes mr chowdhury is also on there as well so three of us are actually there we're just waiting for you all to come and join us okay so i'm now going to hand you over to um mr chowdhury who's going to go through some housekeeping well housekeeping just um, a few reminders before he hands over to mr mcfall over to you sir Okay, good evening everybody. Um, my name is Mr. Chowdhury, um, Assistant Principal for Year 7 and 8, um, and I am part of the team that oversee the transition process for Year 6, um, just to make sure that the transition process is as smooth as possible. So, um, I really am excited to welcome you to our last penultimate open um um, open event session and this one is i in my opinion it's the best one um and it's horrible history workshop and it's with mr mcpool and it's an opportunity to really showcase some of the remarkable experiences and events that are covered in our key stage three history curriculum um and i just want to remind you of the um events that are also happening next week so over the course of next week, Monday 23rd of October to Thursday 26th of October, there will be an opportunity to ask any questions that you still have to SLT, um, and that will include um, questions directly to the principal. So if you go on the school website, which Ms. Shallow will sort of show us towards the end of how to navigate that, you'll be able to book a 10-minute slot um, during the course of um and any of those days so again it's real opportunity to make that kind of informed choice as you complete the applications over the course of next week so i would really encourage you to make the most of that and really book in uh, um, a slot for next week so i'm now going to um hand you over to to mr matt paul to kick start the session Hello, lucky I uh, unmuted myself. That was uh, that was a good idea. Okay, um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, thank you. So, if you haven't joined, if you just got in, please you can scan or you can join at slido.com hashtag three o four four nine o five. Okay, now to the next slide. So yes, um, this is me. I'm Mr. Matt Paul. I'm the head of humanities and social sciences. Um, and just so you know, I've got uh, I've got a YouTube channel. Uh, dedicated to history i've got over 200 videos on there i've got 50 videos on my TikTok uh, channel which are used for gcc and a level revision so feel free if you search my name mr matt paul on either youtube or TikTok, you can find my educational videos there they're very popular at ba okay thank you if you just uh, move on to the next slide thank you so the history curriculum of xf academy i'm pretty sure you'd be interested to know so what I've done, I've highlighted this. So I'm just going to read through what we do, okay? So we, we basically, we start in year seven in 1066. So the formation of the English nation. 
okay? And then what we do, we go on a journey through history all the way until what we call like really modern history, um, which is like the Cold War and the history of terror. But in year seven, you'll study the Middle Ages, the Peasants' Revolt, and that is local. I bet you didn't know that happened in Erith, okay? The Peasants' Revolt happened in Erith. Now, that's interesting, isn't it, okay? And there used to be a lot more travel between um, those people that lived on the north of the Thames and people who lived on the south of the Thames. Um, obviously, we look at bread and butter things like the Tudors. Life expectancy, you might think that's a bit strange, but it's a mini medicine course. So not all of our students sadly pick history at GCSE. And medicine um, through time is one of the most popular things that we do at GCSE. So I've done a mini medicine course for year seven because I thought they'd enjoy it. We also got local history. So students understand their place in the world. And we'll have a local study, uh, study of Bexley. And there's some really interesting things about Bexley. For example, plastic surgery was kickstarted in Bexley. You may have heard of Queen Mary's Hospital. Well, that hospital was built after World War I so that it could facilitate um, plastic surgery for men with facial injuries. It was in the trenches. Well, where's the one place you're going to get shot? It's in the face. And actually 90% of men were shot in the face if they were shot at all. Okay. Um, and obviously that was very disfiguring. Now, um, in year eight, we do a very interesting deep look at the British Empire. We look at the growth and decline. Um, and that really helps a lot of our students understand our place in the world. And it also broadens the debate of the British Empire. And we have a very balanced and nuanced study of whether the British Empire was, in fact, a positive thing for the world or a negative thing for the world. And students left to make their own minds up about that. OK, we then move on to the Industrial Revolution, which is very, very important because it changed the whole way that everyone lived from a feudal system to an industrial one. And then we've got the causes and events of World War One, the, the interwar years. And then we get into year nine and uh, they studied the Roaring Twenties, which is very popular because Al Capone and gangsters and prohibition, Elliot Ness, all things like that come up. It's a very interesting period. We then move on to the causes and battles of World War One, And then we have a more somber look at the Holocaust um, in uh, term four of year nine with key studies around key historical figures like Anne Frank. And finally, we move on to the Cold War. And lastly, the history of terror. Um, so we get a very broad ex uh, experience of history for key stage three. OK, if we can move on. That'd be great. Now, should your child uh, and should, uh, one of our scholars at BA, should they choose to study? Um, I think we've gone too, too ahead there, miss. Have we? Have we gone too ahead? No, we haven't. All right. Can we go ahead? All right. So, right. So if they, yes, here we go. That's what I was looking for. I've maybe I've put this in the wrong order. I do apologize. So at GCSE, um, we study these topics. So medicine through time. World War One um, in the trenches and surgery in the trenches in particular. We then study, we have a real in-depth look at uh, Nazi and Weimar Germany from 1918 to 1939. We will then, in year 11, move on to the Cold War. And finally, Elizabeth I, 1558 to 1588, we we'll look at all the great things she did as a strong female leader. So we have a very balanced uh, GCC curriculum as well. And then we, our students get to revise. And because we implement intervention, um, our students are in a very secure place. And actually, history was one of the few subjects uh, in the academy where our grades uh, went up quite a bit last year, which I'm very proud of as a head of department. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's let's uh, move. Can we move to the A-level? So we might have to move back before we move forward. So I do apologise. OK, so at A-level, our students will study three topics, the Russian Revolution, the British Empire and the French Revolution. So there's lots of revolutionary activity. OK, I think it's... Uh, a very in-depth look uh, through history. Okay, we can move on. If we can move on. Right, now check in. Now you need to put this in your Slido, okay? What do you know about these pictures? What do these pictures bring to mind? Can you tell me that? Can you put those answers in the Slido? So don't be shy. Don't be shy, guys. Let's put the answers in. We'd love to see some activity in the Slido. What do those pictures mean? Can we see what, now do we recognize that picture there? Is that reminiscent? These soldiers here, what army would they have fought for? And what position are these men in here? Okay. So I'm just waiting for some answers in the Slido. I'll just give you a minute, guys, just to acquaint yourself with those pictures. Aha, uh -huh. thank you, Isabel. 
Well done. The last one is in the trenches. Thank you, Isabel. That's an excellent answer. Okay, thank you for being confident and, and putting an answer in there. So the last one is in the trenches. What about the other two pictures? Can anyone else, like, would you know, like, if men wore red, which country would they be fighting for, for instance? Okay. I mean, we do study British history, so there might be a little bit of a clue there. Okay. And if we don't know about the red coats, that's fine. But uh, you're free to comment if you'd like on the uh, on the chat. Okay, on the Slido chat. Right. Well done, Isabel. Thank you. I'm gonna give you a thumbs up for your answer there. Okay, we're gonna move on, and I'll I'll give you some answers, guys. Okay. So, the first one is of plague doctors, and plague doctors were popular during the Great Plague of London, which happened in 1665. Now they wore wax coats, and that actually gave them protection from fleas. Okay. And therefore gave them protection from the plague. Okay. Right. Next answer. Thank you. Right. So the British Army used red as their standard uniform until 1914. Now, one of the reasons for this was that if a man was shot, it wasn't as noticeable. So people would panic less. Now, actually, it became uh, not so good in the trenches of World War One, And the red dye was actually too expensive. Okay. Um, so it was no longer used. Okay, next. All right, and during World War One, okay, as Isabel uh, said, okay, World War, in World War One, men were put in the trenches, and that was to protect them from machine gun fire. So war became very defensive, which is why the boundaries didn't move very much in four years of warfare. Okay, and Isabel's from Bursted Wood. Well, that's great. We have a lot of students from Bursted Wood that attend this academy. All right, moving on. Moving on. So we're going to do a six round quiz today okay a horrible history quiz so you're very lucky because when I, was, when I was at school we didn't have horrible history on the tv we just had them in books and i remember being a young boy and really enjoying reading those books okay but i'm going to give you a horrible history quiz today so if we can move forward okay right we and again if you've just joined you can join slido.com at 3044905 okay moving forward miss Oh, so right, okay. So round one. Who am I? Okay, so we've got eight faces there. We've got eight faces. Can you name any of those historical faces? Answers in the slido. Okay, answers in the slido, guys. So if you can put the answer in the slido, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. All right. So some of those faces you may have seen them on a five pound note. Some of those faces may be more recognisable than others because you may have studied them in history already or your parents or guardians at home would have studied them when they're at school because they're so famous in British history. So quite a few of them are British monarchs. Okay, not all of them are British. And one is a very famous British prime minister. So I've given you a few hints there. So guys, with that in mind, I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes. Okay, like a minute or two. And let's see if you can get some of those answers in the Slido. So I'd like to say well done to Isabel for being our top commenter so far. But don't be shy, guys. Don't be shy. If you know who those faces are, please contribute in the chat. That would be brilliant. Okay, I think, should we move on and reveal the answers? Okay, so here's the answers, guys. So, the first one is Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister during World War II. Okay, and after this, we have King Henry VIII, famously. Ah, well done, Isabel, for your answers. So, Isabel, you're a top scorer so far. Well done. Winston Churchill, Henry VIII. Yes, three is Hitler and four is Elizabeth I. Well done. Oh, sorry, free is, <laughs> free is Joseph Stalin. So I'm reading your answers there and getting excited and carried away. So, yes, we've got Henry VIII, famously who, married, who had six wives. Divorce Behead died. Divorce Behead survived. Number three, we've got Joseph Stalin, who was a dictator of the, uh, the Soviet Union from 1924 to 1953. Uh, after that, we have Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth, two very famous long-reigning British queens. And after that, we have JFK. A famous American president who dated Marilyn Monroe, went to Berlin and said, Ich bin ein Berliner, and was sadly assassinated in 1963. And his long-standing enemy there is Fidel Castro, 
that instigated the Cuban Missile Crisis. And last but not least, someone that you may have studied at primary school, it's Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp. OK, we've got the lady with the lamp. OK, so that's round one. So, all right, Isabel is on 40 points. Well done, Isabel. You're on 40 points so far. You're our top scorer. Now, round two is a video round. So you'd have to click on the link and then it's going to take you to a YouTube video. OK, so um, you have to play that in the link. I hope that works. OK, to 1666. In the spring of 1665, an epidemic of the bubonic plague emerged in London, England. The plague began in the parish of St Giles in the Fields, a poor area outside of London's walls. And as spring turned to a hot summer, it became an epidemic. The second plague pandemic is speculated to have started in China and spread through Europe through trade. The bubonic plague is caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis, which is transmitted by fleas that live on rats. Victims would have symptoms including fever, coughing up blood, and painful buboes, blisters, and bruises on the body. Victims typically died within days of catching the illness. The poorest areas were the most unsanitary, with rubbish and waste littering the streets, and were therefore the hardest hit by the plague. Doctors were also too expensive for most people, although their treatment was limited in its effectiveness because they thought miasmas, or bad air, was the cause of the plague. The rich, meanwhile, as they could afford to, fled the city. King Charles II, the nobility, parliament and most merchants, lawyers and doctors fled, while the poor remained. The Lord Mayor and Aldermen also remained, to keep order and stop the disease spreading further. In June, the Mayor closed the gates of London to people without a certificate of health, as the roads were bottlenecked from people trying to escape the city. By autumn, 7,000 people were dying from the plague every week in the city. Watchmen were employed to enforce the quarantine. If a person was infected or had died of the plague, their old family would be locked away with them in their house, sealed from the outside and kept guard over. A red cross was then painted on the door to distinguish it. Soon enough, the old family would be infected and would suffer the same way. A common sight was also drivers of dead cars with piles of bodies who moved around the streets calling, Bring out your dead! and the dead would be buried in mass graves. As winter came, the spread of disease was slowed down. From December 1665, people started to return to London, and by February 1666, the death toll had decreased to a level that was safe for the king to return. It is estimated that up to 100,000 people died in London from the Great Plague. After the Great Plague, the Great Fire of London would again engulf the city in disaster but it may also have helped kill off some of the rats and fleas carrying the plague. Subscribe for more history videos. You were sharp of eye, okay, and uh, very focused there. So I see the presentation's off and it's just me. Is there any way we can get the presentation um, back on? Because otherwise it'll be hard to... Visit. There we go. Thank you. That's lovely. Okay. So let's see. Can you answer any of these questions? Any of these questions? All right. So if you know any of those, I'll be mightily impressed. Okay. So in what year... I'm going to read these out. Okay. In what year was the Great Plague of London? Mm -hmm. Who was the king during the Great Plague of London? In what English parish were the earliest cases recorded? Why did the plague spread so quickly? Where is the plague speculated to have started? Which bacteria is responsible for the plague? Which areas were hardest hit by the plague? Which official remained in London? And what colour cross was painted on the door? And finally, what helped to end the plague in 1666? So I'm just going to leave that up for um, a, a minute or two and see if... Isabel or anyone else can get any answers in the Slido. Okay. Um, you don't have to answer all of them. If there's answers that you do know, just put a number next to it. We can tally up the points that way. Okay. So I'm just going to um, mute and stop my cam just whilst you're trying to do that. Okay. 
we'll just leave it up there so that they have the opportunity to write their answers in yeah for just a minute or so And don't be shy, even if you only know one answer, okay, to one of the questions, that's fine. Just put what you know in the Slido. That would be great for your participation. Wow, thank you, Isabel. Okay, 1665. Two, St. Charles, St. Charles in the parishes. Okay, four rats. Six. Okay, six is not asthma. Okay, but that's a good good attempt. Number seven, yes, London and the poor. And yes, Red Crosses. Well done, Isabel. Great answers. Okay, can we reveal the answers? Thank you. Okay, lovely. So yes, 1665, King Charles II, St. Charles in the field, due to hot weather. China. Yes, senior pestis, the poorest areas of London, the mayor of London, and a Red Cross are the answers to those questions. Now let's move on to round three. Round three, guys. Okay, and you can join Slido at 304905. Okay, all right. Next slide. Thank you. Let's look at round three. Aha! We have a word search round. Okay, now you have to answer this in the Slido. So find the seven countries that were once part of the British Empire. Now, I'm going to be very kind. I'm going to be very kind, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to allow you to go to the next slide. And there's some hints with some flags. That will help. There's some very friendly. I think that's a very nice, nice, helpful set of hints. But you need to know your flags. If you don't know your flags, you're not going to know which countries they are. Okay, so I'm going to leave them on for now. And if you can find any of those answers... I'm going to be mightily impressed. Mightily impressed, guys. Well done, Isabel. Canada. Okay. 10 points to Isabel. Brilliant. Okay. Can you name any of others? That's the question. Yes. Can you name any of the others? Okay. The USA. Australia. Australia. Yeah, that's right. Okay, but it's not the only one. There's others. And there's a very similar flag down there on the left. Okay, and you said Seed Africa. You are, that's true. Seed Africa is there. Jamaica, I'm not going to attempt that accent. Um, <laughs> yes, so Jamaica, that's one, certainly. Well done, Isabel. You're doing really well. Okay, look at this. Canada, USA, Australia, South Africa, Jamaica. Now, could you identify the flag, which is red, white, and black? That'd be impressive. Okay. And if that's all, of this, if that's all you know, that's fine. Oh, India, brilliant! Well done. Yes, India was a massive part of the British Empire. Okay, it was the wealthiest part of the British Empire. And actually, if you've ever been to Danson, and you've got Danson House, you've got a beautiful uh, building where there are weddings there. It's a listed building that was built during the 1700s because of the East India Company. So if it wasn't for all the wealth from India, that wouldn't be there today. Okay. And Kenya. Yes. Well done. Very good. Very good. Can we reveal the answers, Miss Shallow? That'd be lovely. Okay. Yes. India, Jamaica, Australia, Canada, USA, New Zealand, and Egypt. Okay. Let's move on. Thank you. But Kenya was part of the British Empire, by the way. Right. So um, can you match the rulers to the country? Okay. So number one, we've got George Washington. Number two, we've got Charles I. Number three, we've got Tutankhamun. Number four, Mussolini. And number five is Nicholas. I think on the slide, it hasn't come out quite correctly, but that says USA and that says UK at the top. So can you match the rulers to the countries? Can you match the rulers to the country? So which leader ruled which country? Okay. So that is round four. Which ruler ruled which country? Now, there are some potential hints I could give here. I could, uh, you know, go through the litany of different accents, which I'm very good at impersonating. I think Miss Shallow, Mr. Chowdhury, are 
very envious of my accent impersonations. Well done, Isabel. George Washington and USA. Oh, hi. I actually used to live in the USA. I used to live in Connecticut, and isn't that swell? Okay, so yes, I lived in New England, in Connecticut, for two years when I was a child, when I was eight until I was ten. Okay, well done, Isabel. Yes, George Washington was leader of the USA. And what about Charles I? Hmm? We've actually got Charles III at the moment. Now, Tutankhamun was the leader of Egypt. Well done, Isabel. Very good. Now, next, we've got the fascist leader of Italy, known as Il... Oh, I'll just give the answer. Right, Il Duce, Mussolini was... <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Tsar Nicholas. He's actually Tsar Nicholas II, and he was the final royal of a country. So, if you want to join in... Okay, time for answers. All right, let's go through them then. Okay, where's our answers? Are the answer's not there? Well, don't worry. I can tell you anyway. All right. So, yes, George Washington's the USA. Charles I is England. Tutankhamun is Egypt. Uh, number four, Muslim is Italy. And Tsar Nicholas II is Russia. Okay. And well done to Isabel for three correct answers. Excellent. Okay. Although, technically, the UK didn't exist at that point. Right. Now, the football war. So, we've got a video. Okay. And, yeah, if you can just watch that. There is a little warning that comes up, but it's just because it's about war. Okay. Right. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's fine. It really is nothing major. Right. Go on. Just. You have two seconds to name these two countries. You're wrong. Unless you got it right. Then good job. They are, of course, Honduras and El Salvador. One thing these two countries have in common is being fanatic about football. Or if you're a freedom-loving patriot, soccer. But do they love it so much they would go to war over it? You bet they would. And that is no bueno. If you look at these two countries, you might notice one major difference, and that is that this one is a lot bigger than this one. However, this one had a larger population than this one, made up mostly of farmers, and there wasn't enough land for them to live and work on. So they started moving from El Salvador to Honduras in search of land, and by the 1960s, a huge number of illegal immigrants had crossed over the border from El Salvador. Meanwhile, in Honduras, it's 1963, and this guy has just staged a military coup to prevent the rise of communism, and is now the military leader of the country. He immediately began harassing the peasants' unions and other left-wing groups, but he's a little insecure about the legitimacy of his leadership. So he holds an election and wins, but then the opposing party says, Hey man, that election was clearly corrupt and fraudulent, and also you've been bribed by the rich American banana companies who are taking all of our bananas tax-free, and now our economy is in ruins. And everyone started to get mad at him. Now if you ever find yourself the barely legitimate military leader of a corrupt Central American country, and you start getting into hot water, here's a bit of advice that has been tried and tested throughout the centuries. Blame something else. So he blamed the Salvadoran immigrants for stealing all the land and all the jobs and ruining Honduras. The immigrants found themselves under attack by the hostile locals. Egged on by the rich American banana companies who wanted all the bananas to themselves, the Honduran government began evicting Salvadoran immigrants who had been living on the land for generations and started sending them back to El Salvador. The Salvadoran elite were furious and protested, citing moral reasons, but in reality, they were just getting a little too crowded. So tensions were about as high as they could be, but then... It's the 1970 World Cup qualifiers, and both countries finished top of their qualifying table, so it was now time for them to play against each other in a series of matches. The first match took place in Honduras. The night before the game, Hondurans gathered outside the Salvadoran team's hotel, making noise and taunting them. The next day, Honduras defeated the exhausted Salvadorans with a late 90th minute goal. After the match, a young Salvadoran fan, unable to bear her country's defeat, shot herself. Disturbingly, the Salvadoran government glorified the incident and made her into a national hero. And at the next game, fans brought pictures of her to the stadium. Emotions were running high as the next match took place in El Salvador, and this time, the tables were turned. The Hondurans had to endure a sleepless night in their hotel, and the next day, before the match started, instead of the Honduran flag, the Salvadorans raised a dirty rag. So great job at reducing tensions. El Salvador won decisively over the exhausted Hondurans. While spectators battled in the stands, Team Honduras fled home in a bulletproof bus with rocks being thrown at them, and the Honduran coach reportedly told his players that they were lucky they lost. In response to the defeat, Hondurans began terrorizing the Salvadoran settlers even more, in some cases reportedly throwing them off their land and burning down their homes, and the immigrants began fleeing back to El Salvador. The final game in Mexico would decide who went to the World Cup. It was close, but El Salvador came out victorious, knocking Honduras out of the tournament. The atmosphere is riotous. 
literally. And back in Honduras, attacks on the Salvadoran immigrants further increased. This was too much for El Salvador to bear. With its people under attack and an unmanageable refugee crisis on its hands, El Salvador severed all diplomatic ties with Honduras and declared war. The football war is also known as the 100 Hours War because that's how long it lasted, making it one of the shortest wars in history. El Salvador started by carrying out air raids on strategic locations within Honduras, including Toncantin International Airport, which prevented the Honduran Air Force from getting into the sky. Then, with their superior army, they began an invasion along two major roads, complete with light tanks and infantry. Their advance was rapid, and they were quickly approaching the Honduran capital. Then the organization of American states met in a bit of a panic and unanimously agreed that war between El Salvador and Honduras was a bad thing and probably shouldn't continue. So they went to El Salvador and said, can you please stop invading? And El Salvador declared, not until they stop being jerks. And so the war went on. The Honduran Air Force finally got into the sky and with aid from neighboring Nicaragua, they successfully carried out air raids on Salvadoran air bases and oil facilities, crippling the Salvadoran supply line and stopping their advance dead. Caught in a bit of a stalemate, the situation was no longer advantageous to El Salvador. So when the Organization of American States once again asked them to stop and agreed to ensure the safety of the Salvadoran immigrants, El Salvador relented and a ceasefire was organized on the 18th of July. Then the OAS said, can you now please withdraw your troops from Honduras? No, please, no, please, no, please, no. Do it or we'll sanction you. You know what? Just for you? I'll do it. So El Salvador pulled its troops out of Honduras on the 2nd of August, and with casualties in the thousands, the war was over. The economies of both nations were damaged by the war, and El Salvador didn't have the capability to take care of all the returning immigrants, a crisis that eventually helped cause a civil war. The war left behind land and border disputes, some of which are still a cause of tension to this day. El Salvador went on to play in the World Cup, but lost every match they played and didn't make it past the group stage. So in the end, nobody achieved anything, and there were no winners. Except for this guy. Thank you. Wow, I was getting to a bit of a dancey dancey there. So, here are some questions for you, and you can reply on the Slido. So, which two countries were involved? And again, what you can do, um, if you don't know the answer to all the questions, uh, you can just put down... The numbers which you do know and correspond an answer next to that number. So which two countries were involved in the war? What was the key cause of the war? Why did the Honduran, what did the Hondurans do at the El Salvador Hotel? What happened at the uh, Honduran Hotel on the return, log, return leg in El Salvador? Well done, Isabel. You've got number one right. Um, which country invaded the other? And which organisation threatened sanctions on El Salvador? And last but not least, how many casualties were there in this war? Oakley Doakley. So, Isabel, if you know any other answers, if you know any other answers, feel free. Feel free. I know he's a bit fast-paced. Number two, football was a key cause of the war. Okay, football was definitely a key cause of the war. That's a correct answer. There's different answers, which you could have put down. So, perhaps immigration, okay, and farming space. But, yeah, uh, football is definitely a good answer. Okay, and what did the hidden hand drawings do to the El Salvador Hotel? They were a little bit naughty, weren't they? Um, I wouldn't say invaded it, but it's a good answer, Isabel. What I'd say is that they made a lot of noise. They made a whole lot of noise. So, okay, let's see if you can do four, five, six, or seven, Isabel, because you've done one, two, and three. So what happened at the Honduran Hotel on the return leg? What did they do? What did they do to that hotel? Which country invaded the other? Which organization threatened sanctions on El Salvador? And how many casualties were there in this war? So if you know any of the answers, put them down. Okay, we'll give you about 20 seconds to get some more answers down. If you don't know, we can go through those with you. Okay, we can go through those with you. All right. Okay. Yeah, number five. Which country? Yes, Honduras invaded El Salvador. Okay. Right, which organization? Well, actually, it was El Salvador which uh, invaded Honduras, but good attempt, okay? Good attempt. All right, shall we go for the answers? I think we should go for the answers, yeah? Right, so, yes, it's Honduras and El Salvador. Immigration, but football's also an answer you could have. Number three, they kept them awake all night. 
Number four, they were kept awake all night by El Salvador fans. El Salvador invaded Honduras, okay, because El Salvador is small and Honduras was a uh, was large. Organ it was the Organization of American States which threatened sanctions, and um, that's just not a correct answer to number seven. So let's move on and ignore that mistake. Thank you. Okay, that didn't happen. Okay, can we just move on? That'd be great. To round six, our final round. Right now, this is an interesting one. This is one that. I say, I think the teachers should get involved in this as well. I think Miss Shallow, I think Mr. Chowdhury, can they solve those anagrams? Can they solve those anagrams? I think they should give it a whirl. Okay. So these anagrams are historical. Most of these have been re referenced today or implied through certain figures in history. So, Isabel, well done. You've got Anglo-Saxon. What a brain box, I'll tell you. She can solve these mysteries, these history mysteries. Very good. Well done. Okay. Now, number two. Number two. I could give you a hint. He's on the five-pound notes. He was prime minister during World War II. From, not the beginning, though. From 1940 to 1945. Because Neville Chamberlain was before him. Yes, Churchill. Well done. Number three is something that they, uh, people always struggle with. Okay. Always, always people just, uh, uh, struggle with this one. And this is a noun which, um, how do I give you a hint for this? You live in one. There you go. All right, number four, British Empire. Well done. Well done, Isabel. So you live, everyone lives in one of these and it's not a house. Okay. So number three, everyone lives in one of these, but it's not a house. And there's a, there are many of these in the world. And number five, if you think of Henry VIII, he had two of these. Okay. At number five, if you think of Henry VIII, he had two of these. Right. I think we should show the answers. I think we should show the answers. Okay. All right. Yes, divorced for the last one. Well done. Okay. Now let's move on to the answers. Well done, Isabel. It is divorce. Okay. So can we show the answers to that uh, quiz? That would be great. So yes. But what is number three? So if you're in charge of slides, can you please put on the answers for the anagram round? Have you been logged out? I'm just going to give... Right, one second. I'm just going to mute the camera and see if we can get moved on. Thank you. Okay, so we just show the answers. That'd be great. So yes, Anglo-Saxon. Yes, Churchill. Click again. Get on again. All right, number three is countries. People always find that one hard. I don't know why. All right, okay. Number four is British Empire, and number five is divorce. Okay, okay. So if we move on, I think that is the end of our quiz. So we've got some final messages. So Isabel, well done. You are the winner. Thank you for your participation today. You are number one. You are numero uno. I think we should communicate that to. Bursted Woods, how great Isabel was. I think that would be a lovely communication from our school to yours. Sir, I totally agree. I really feel like we should all flood um, uh, Isabel's primary school. So if you send a message, message Mr. Child, you send a message, I send a message to everybody with concern. If you can put your um, year six teacher's name in the in the chat, um, in the, well, the Slido um, chat, um, Isabel, then we know exactly who to address that email to as well. And just send you lots and lots of, because we're super proud of you. The fact that you have engaged with Sir all the way through, you've attempted every single question is amazing. I can tell you are really a horrible history participant. Yeah. So, Sir, you've got one to look forward to next year. You know, a very keen um, historian right there in the making. I feel like we get one every year. We, but, John, yeah. we, we get more than one. We got so many of our year sevens. They love history. You know, they love history. So I'm teaching um, three year seven classes this year. And wow. the passion, 
the passion is just abundant. So yeah, I've been very, very impressed. Okay, that explains your um, reward slides for history. So it was endless. It was literally littered with names and amazing reasons that you gave your year seven. So it makes perfect sense. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Mr. McFall. Um, thank you for making the session so engaging for the young people as well. Love the six games. I was behind the scene taking part. I think in the last one, the only two I would have gotten right, if I'm being honest, um, is the first and the fifth one. Yeah, so British Empire and anglo-saxons anglo-saxons yeah yeah so that's yeah. what they only two. well well done well done miss you know almost as good as isabel but maybe that's hard to live up to you know well this <laughs> is it to be fair yeah um and then so i really think you need to leave the um the accents like it's, it's you're not that good at it anymore sorry to <laughs> the wrong point. what is, what is this the american accent you did it took me i was trying to work out what accent <laughs> it was that you were trying it took me a very long time my and class is love my accents they're, they're in all of them they're like wow how's it how are you so accurate those accents anyway wow. we'll agree to disagree but thank you thank you for giving thank us you so much mr mcfall right mr mcfall you might want to just stay on just in case anyone has any questions that they might want to ask for history and all i'm going to do year six um parents and carers is just to talk you through um an event that uh, mr chowdry mentioned which is um the book a question and answer it's 10 minutes question and answer session with one of the um either the vice principal or um the principal herself okay so i'm going to go ahead and just present my screen so if i just go to our school's website i'll share that screen with you in a moment okay so bexley heath academy perfect i'm take it over here Right, hopefully you can all see my screen. Yes, you can. Okay, so what you will need to do, just bear with me one second. I'll make this a bit better for you. Um, Okay, okay. I think I'm going to just leave it as that. Let's not, you know, break, spoil something that's not broken. Right, so if you go to our school's website and uh, you look for, you click on Year 6 um, Tours 2023, um, you will be familiar with this site anyways, because this is where you've gone to book your appointment for our um, in-person tours and also for our sessions that you have linked on to today, last week, the week before and so on and so forth. The previous videos, you're all familiar with this page. Now we just added a new section and that's called year six parents um, question and answer with principal and vice principals. Now there's a link for you to book. So just so you know, it's going to run from Monday. So Monday next with the 23rd, to Thursday the 26th of October and the session will run from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. So it gives your um, your parents time to come back from work, settle down with you, and then they have 10 minutes of questions to ask, okay? So if you click on the link and all you can, as you can see, you just go on there and you can actually go ahead and book yourself a session, okay? Like I said, the sessions, they start from five o'clock. They're 10 minutes intervals or 10 minutes each time. So we can see that, um, well, 5.20, 5.30, uh, and I'm guessing 5.40 is gone um, on the first day, so the 23rd. But we've still got lots of places to book, okay? So just go on there, um, have your booking. And then what would happen as soon as you booked, um, by, say, Sunday for the appointments for Monday, um, the SLT that's going to be answering your question is going to send you directly uh, a Google invite through the email address that you have used to um, actually book your session and you will use that link to then join to ask your questions if you've got any doubt so if you're not sure what to do once you've actually booked your appointment please feel free to send uh, mr chowdhury an email or send myself an email okay um do we normally have mr chowdhury's email i don't think we've got it on any of the slides but yeah so um Mr. Chowdhury, an email or literally just get your parents to call the school and speak to a member of staff at reception and they should be able to forward your message on to, on to us. And I'll pass you over to Mr. Chowdhury for any last um, messages. Over to you, sir. 
Right, so, um, thank you so much, Miss, and thank you so much to Mr. Matt Paul for, for ma making this such an interactive and engaging um, sort of quiz session. Um, and I was really in awe of the kind of accents myself, um, especially being an English teacher and having to kind of do voices, um, trying to impersonate accents. I would really sort of value a bit of coaching from Mr. Matt Paul on that. Um, so uh, just to remind... Uh, um, everyone, um, if you can, again, like, you know, to echo Miss Shallow, please make sure that you um, try and book in the slot if you've still got any questions that you would like to ask, um, particularly as we move on to that last week of submitting those applications. Um, I think that this, these sessions are there designed to make sure that you're in the best possible position to make that informed decision. So I would advise you, um, if you've got any questions, please make sure you book in the slot. So thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to also to welcoming you all to Bexley Heath Academy um, very soon. Take care now. Bye.